All right, friends. We have been learning Parshat Chukat all week. Let's talk about a different part of the Torah portion today. Parshat Chukat can be seen through many lenses, including a leadership bridge from one generation to the next. Parshat Chukat includes the death of Miriam, includes the death of Aharon, and it foretells the death of Moshe. Those are the three recognizable figures who have been leading the people for a generation and a half, whose service on behalf of the community and whose vision, inspired by God, whose calling, is nothing short of spectacular, noble, effective, wise. All of that embodies the different kind of functions that each one of them takes. Aaron is the high priest, Miriam is a prophet, and Moshe is the law bringer in addition to also being a prophet and serving God in an in innermost way, the way a priest would. Moshe combines a lot of the roles. But what's really important is to recognize that between last week's Torah portion, Korach, and this week's Torah portion, at least the commentators believe 38 years have passed. It's jumping around in time to give us a sense of history. Now, last week, Moshe's leadership, Aaron's leadership, is challenged by Korach. And that rebellion is put down. But this is a different kind of moment where the challenge to leadership is simply not a challenge. It's just the evolution of who is in front of the people on the trajectory that has been promised, challenged. From Sinai till now, there has been a very complicated and bumpy path that has been led with nobility and with passion by these siblings, by Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Of course, by the way, the birth order is different. It's Miriam, Aaron, and Moshe. And so what a powerful thing it is to be able to step into this Parsha in a moment where this is a current conversation. The bridge role of any leader who has gained enough wisdom of an entire generation of leaders is to make sure that leaders in the future will be able to continue that path forward. This isn't making a political or partisan comment. It's saying that the Torah knows that transition between generations of leadership is incredibly important and needs to be part of the public discourse, is so important that it is even considered sacred. This Torah portion includes the death of all, well, the death of two and mention of the death of the third of the most important leaders we have ever had. And so here we are recognizing that in this week's Torah portion, we are looking at our leaders, but it is also important to look at a part of the Torah portion that we haven't mentioned this week yet. Now, as is true of every generation of Israelite and then later of every generation of Jew, and probably true about everybody else, but I know it best within our community. The, um, the role of the people seems to be to complain about whatever they've got. We are, of course, commanded to cultivate gratitude. We wake up in the morning recognizing the grandeur, the miracle of just having another day of breathing. But it is true that we are very good at complaining. In fact, there's a, a real story that, um, that happened in my world when I was first ordained, when I first got smicha in 2002. Um, I was in a community in Sharon, Massachusetts, a very special very special community. There was one gentleman in the shul for whom, and this is true, every shul has a whole bunch of people who feel this way, that it was either too hot or too cold in the sanctuary. Always, no matter what. It was either too hot or too cold, sometimes both somehow. And uh, this gentleman would always ask the custodian, because on Shabbat the custodian changed the temperature, um, to make it hotter or cooler. And we noticed that this was the case. So a few of us spoke to the custodian in advance and said, listen, when he says it's too hot or too cold, I want you to say, we want you to say, no problem, I'll go take care of it. Walk out of the sanctuary. Don't do anything. And then come back into the sanctuary and check in with this gentleman. So, sure enough, that next Shabbat, the gentleman felt like it was too hot. Called over the custodian. The custodian said, what's, what's the matter? person said, it's too hot in here. Can you go, can you take care of that? The custodian said, absolutely, I'll make it better. And he leaves the sanctuary, 
does nothing, 20 minutes later, comes back in, goes right up to the gentleman and says, how is it now? And the gentleman said, ah, much better. Which tells you a few things. Often when we complain, it is an inner truth that we are reflecting, something about needing to be heard. So what is this generation of Israelite, who was actually the second generation in the desert, complaining about? They're complaining about the manna. They're complaining about the miraculous food that God sends. They say it's not nourishing, it's not substantive. And a plague happens. The plague that apparently is sent by God to punish those for not having gratitude, for not appreciating the miracle of the manna. The plague is snakes. Snakes come and attack the people. And Moses calls out, and in order to save the people, God commands him to create a fiery serpent, a saraf. Now, the way that Moshe creates it is two interwoven snakes on a staff. And you might recognize the symbol because it has become a symbol for medicine and healing. That's the origin of this. But the Torah text says that whenever the people who were being attacked by snakes, when they were bitten and therefore in danger of dying, when they would look upon this um, copper snake, <clears throat> which is what Moshe made this snake out of, the staff out of, um, they would be healed. And it's very powerful. Tradition looks at the difference between the snakes that were attacking and the snake that was doing the healing. And they find a, a number of different things, and this is where I'd like us to spend just a moment of learning. Number one, midah keneged midah, measure for measure. Snakes were doing the attacking, so too were snakes, was a snake doing the healing. So that's interesting, that corresponds. So too, the Israelites were complaining about manna, and we know about manna that it tasted like whatever you wanted it to taste like. Well, what do you know about uh, uh, the original snake in the Garden of Eden? God cursed the snake for tricking the people by saying, you will crawl on the earth and everything will taste like dust to you. So the people complained about food that could taste like anything, and God chose a punishment that was the inability to differentiate any flavor. All of these are fascinating, but there is one more comment. This is from the Orachayim, who says that Moshe chose Nechoshet, copper, to make the miraculous snake out of. And it's an interesting thing, because if you listen closely, the word for copper is Nechoshet, and the word for snake is Nachash. It is fascinating to know that there is an etymological connection between the copper and the snake, and the Orachayim, a mystical rabbi, ended up pointing to a belief, it's not in the Torah text, that the copper was chosen because it was reflective. In those days, copper was the closest to a mirror that many people could access. And what did the mirror show them? What does the mirror show us? Healing can be at least in part, based on self-reflection. Because, after all, what was the mistake that the Israelites made? They were looking outward and not looking inward. Part of the healing language in Chukat, the whole idea of the para adima, the red heifer that we've been talking about, and the nachash, the snake, and the nachoshet, the copper, understood through the prism of these interpreters, of course, is that in order to be healthy, we have to look within. You can't look, as I began this comment with, only looking at your leaders and who's standing in front. You also have to look within. What is it that we need? The accumulated wisdom of two generations of leadership that was within Aaron and Miriam and Moses was the only way we made it through these 40 years. In order to understand that and to see that the miracles that they channeled were enough for our life in the hardest of conditions on a 40-year journey that we did not make easier. In order to understand what their leadership represented, we have to understand the challenge that we presented. What is it to navigate a way forward? It is many things. Ron, as you celebrate your 92nd birthday tomorrow, I am sure, I am sure, 
but the wisdom that you have gained during your years has been shared with community. In fact, by participating in our community so regularly, this wonderful Torah learning nine o'clock community that has existed and loved each other for 1,092 mornings, you have gained enough to share. And you know enough, we all have to learn this over the course of our lives, that we are the only source of wisdom. Sharing leadership and cultivating gratitude and learning from experience are essential ingredients for a healthy future. Chukat is many things, this Torah portion. But please God, if we combine all of the messages, it should be that things don't always make sense. And in order to figure out what to do, we have to step into self-reflection, communal wisdom, and chart a course forward together. May we be blessed, friends, as we continue to navigate these incredibly rocky times, as we pray for the welfare of our family, as we work hard to cultivate whatever gratitude and wisdom we can so that we can move forward, so that as we work hard to bring our family home, as we commit ourselves next week to a week of goodness. May we truly step in to our next steps with increased health, with regard for each other, with respect for our leaders, with appreciation for everything we have, because it could be otherwise, and with a recognition that John points out that the nachash, the snake in the nachosh at the healing copper serpent, Right? Venom can kill, but it can also be an ingredient in antidotes. That which has been hard for us can also be the path forward if we would only let in its wisdom. May we be blessed. May our family be whole. May we enter Shabbat with renewed spirit. Let's sing a little bit. We're going to sing a song for Shabbat, and then we're going to sing Hatikva. So... As we sing this nigun, maybe do a little dancing. Let's pray. Let's pray for our family to come home. Two hundred and eightieth day since October seventh, on broadcast one thousand ninety two and on Erev Shabbat, leading into a week of goodness that you and I are going to amplify with our entire soul. Let's send our hearts east. Sing for our people. Sing so that they might know how loved they are from the distance. Sing to them while they're still in darkness. Make sure they know how loved they are how ready we are to hold them again. Bring them home. Kol hon balevav penima nefesh yehudi homia ulefate mizrach 
kadima ayim letzion sofia on lo avda tikvatenu ha tikvam bat shnot alpayim liot am khofshi beharzenu Eretz Zion, Virshalayim, Liot am Chofshi, Be'arzenu, Eretz Zion, Virshalayim. Bring them home now. Am Yisrael Chai. Shabbat Shalom. See you on Monday, friends.